Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for joining us today for our weekly webinar series. Today, our featured topic is understanding and choosing an OTDR. My name is Jessica Petrohoy, and I'm the marketing coordinator at fiberoptic.com. Fiberoptic.com is a leading provider of fiber optic products, training, and rental equipment. We're pleased to present this topic to you today. So with us today to talk about understanding and choosing an OTDR is Christopher Labange. Chris is the president of the ITEL group and fiberoptic.com. Today, Chris will be discussing the factors involved in understanding and choosing an OTDR and what features you need to consider before making the big purchase. Now remember, our webinar series are recorded and available to you online at fiberoptic.com slash webinar. And when Chris is finished, we'll take questions from the GoToWebinar question box at the bottom of your screen for a question and answer session. Uh, thank you again for joining us today. At this time, I turn the presentation over to Chris. Okay, thank you very much, Jessica. I appreciate the introduction. Um, and to all of you out there, um, you know, for the uh, presentation of understanding an OTDR uh, and choosing an OTDR, I think this is a, a very interesting topic. I think it's one that really can't be understated because uh, um, some people believe that when you're purchasing an OTDR, um, there's, uh, it's just going to perform the same regardless of manufacturer, um, user, and uh, distance, and a couple other factors. So we want to really want to help you in making good decisions. And FiberOptic.com has been a leading distributor of fiber optic uh, test and measurement equipment, i.e. OTDRs, for the past 15 years. So it's, it's something we understand well and hopefully can give you a little bit of insight into uh, what might be the right option for you. So uh, again, appreciate your attendance today. Let's get into it. Okay, for the, uh, for the agenda, uh, four main topics that I'll try to address um, throughout the presentation is uh, what do you need to test fiber? So if you're going to use an OTDR, um, that's certainly one of the mechanisms uh, that you can use to test a fiber. Others are power meters, light sources, um, and this is all the physical layer uh, testing procedures that we're talking about here. So um, what you will need to perform your test, um, what type of connectors, you know, will I be using? Um, so whether they're SC is pictured in the, uh, in the screen here in the middle, um, you know, you need to make sure you have the same connection uh, when, you're, when you're connecting to the OTDR or at least your launch box. Really, it would be your launch box in this case, and we'll get into that a little bit more in detail. But uh, what connectors do you have on the end of your fibers? Uh, the fiber under test uh, is going to be an important thing. Um, what features are most important when you're talking about your OTDR? So there will be a couple of key um, configurations or settings that we'll talk about that uh, are really going to be important. And, um, you know, some of these... Some of, well, some of these are settings, some of these aren't. Some of these are uh, characteristics of the test equipment. So some of the settings that we'll want to use, but then also, um, you know, when you're purchasing the OTDR, you know, what wavelengths, what modules, uh, things of that nature do you want to make sure you have because they are not able to be modified in the field. Those are going to be um, set up and configured at the time of purchase. So you want to make sure that you have those all correct. And then uh, where will you get support? Now, are you looking for support from a field rep to come out and uh, give you some training, um, or you know, are you going to you know provide uh, um, you know are you going to really what I'm getting to here you know is how is the support coming? If you do purchase from a U.S. authorized rep, you're going to be able to get uh, support here locally in the states. A lot of transactions are happening over um, you know uh, eBay and and other applications that are. Uh, bringing in product from around the world and you know some of those issues uh, that you have is just you know with that support can you get the support you need can you get the training that you need um, if that's the case so I think that's just something that needs to kind of be considered when you're making your your final purchasing decisions um, not going to knock anybody for for doing what's right for their business but it's just something that should need to be uh, needs to be considered so these are some uh, questions that I think you probably need to uh, have answers to uh, when you're going into you know making your OTDR purchase. Uh, what wavelengths will I need? So wavelengths are obviously going to be important. Um, I'm not sure what level everybody is at, you know, on the on the webinar here. So um, just as a high level overview, what we have is we have several wavelengths that are most commonly used in OTDR testing. Okay. 
there's two types of um, fiber out there. There's single mode and multi-mode fiber. Okay, so if you're working in an environment requiring single mode, you're probably looking at 1310 wavelength, and probably the second wavelength that you would want to test would be 1550 wavelength. Um, if you're working on a multi-mode um, system, which would typically be a premise system inside a building, something like that, you're looking at about 850, um, or about, uh, it's actually 850 nanometers, and then 1300 nanometers would be your second wavelength. So as you'll see in each of those, I gave you at least two wavelengths for each kind of configuration. Um, there are some other options that are out there. Um, that you'll want to, to, to take into consideration, um, and we'll get into a little bit more detail about what those might be later on in the, in the, in the, um, in the presentation, but know that wavelength is going to be a huge um, you know, differentiator, and certainly single mode and multi mode would be the biggest deviation um, you know, that, that, that we would have, and we want to make sure that we understood those, and then there'll be a couple flavors within each of those groups. Uh, what connector types are we using? So as I mentioned, we typically will have a, uh, a connector that is sitting at the end of the fiber under test. So that fiber under test is really going to be the connector or the port at which we're going to make our physical connection. And um, there's a couple things to consider. One is, are you plugging the, the OTDR directly into the fiber? Um, you know, hopefully the answer is no. We really don't want to do that. Um, there's a couple reasons why, and again, we'll get into that um, with damaging the front end of the connector, uh, being able to see the first connector to make sure you have an effective, um, you know, uh, connection uh, and and things of that nature. But um, you will need to know that if you don't have a launch box that has the appropriate connector and appropriate mating sleeve, then maybe you have to connect to it just to, you know, uh, test continuity or get some sort of basic reading. Um, but always be prepared and make sure when you're, you're, you're leaving your, um, your main office going out to the, to the lo location of your test, make sure you have a launch box that has um, at least probably one kilometer if it's going to be a single mode uh, unit or at least 100 meters if it's going to be a multi-mode unit. But make sure you also have a set of adapters that are going to be able to convert from an SC um, to an ST or a Frank Charlie. FC, um, some other ones out there uh, that you may come across um, are Biconic or SMA uh, connectors, things of that nature. So make sure you have a variety of adapters and things of that nature, so that when you get out there, you're you're going to be you know going to be covered and uh, have the appropriate fiber um, you know connectivity to perform your test. So connector types always important uh, to, to know. What distances will you be testing? Um, obviously. Um, the distance is going to be an important factor. There are lower end OTDRs that are perfectly acceptable and perform perfectly well in shorter distances, but once you get out to the field and you're trying to maybe test a, you know, 50, 60 kilometer span, um, depending on the amount of loss that is uh, intrinsic in that span, your, let's just say, metro or, or fiber to the home type of, um, you know, um, OTDR, might not have enough power to be able to make an accurate uh, reading. So uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more detail as well with the power you know, settings and what you need to, to get into, um, making sure that you have the appropriate unit for, for uh, uh, the distances. Um, and then also, what type of tools um, you know, are frequently used with OTDRs? So if you're going to go out and, and perform some sort of test, and one example might be um, you know, the, the recently uh, launched um, brake locator, which is kind of a, uh, let's just call it like a poor man's OTDR. Um, and that was uh, the OBL, uh, I think it's called the 301A, uh, launched by Precision Rated Optics, which we just sold uh, a number of units to uh, Cablevision you know, recently. And, uh, it really f came uh, out of a function of um, usability and how the tech was going to use the unit. So as you see, the next item on the list here is PM for basically stands for power meter. So on a power meter, do we need a power meter on this um, particular uh, OTDR? Uh, visual fault locator and also a VIP, um, video inspection probe. So again, when we look at this, uh, I look at the, the procedures in the process. So what the, the procedures are and what we worked with, um, you know, training the technicians in the field are, um, you know, on was the 
what is the first step that you would you know take um, in troubleshooting a fiber if you went out into the field? And I believe what we understood the the first step would be was that they would use a power meter to see if power was coming through the line. So um, normally this could be a separate unit, but you know if you want to keep it all in one, it makes some sense. So the first step would be to unconnect the the fiber from the port plug it into the power meter, get a measurement to see if any kind of light was coming through. There should be an absolute uh, amount of power that is expected to be coming through there. And uh, if you don't see that, then you need to kind of start to go through a, a, a series of additional tests. Um, one of those might be, um, you know, seeing uh, whether there's any uh, damage or, or breaks in the fiber. So step one was the power meter. Step two became the OTDR. So they had a actual single wavelength OTDR. That's why they call it a break locator, not an OTDR, because it was really using one one wavelength, and really we like to you know, consider two wavelengths whenever using OTDR so that we can detect uh, macro bands and other things in there. But for a, a simple troubleshooting process um, that we shot out a 1625 um, nanometer wavelength over that fiber to see if there was a break down uh, the span, you know, some distance. Um, if that came back and didn't show any uh, additional problems, what the next step was, it was to look at a VFL, um, and the VFL would be put on the end connector there, just to see if the connector was broken anywhere in the NID, uh, right at the end there, right before it came out of the, the connector, and if it was broken, the VFL would glow and, and highlight any kind of damage. So, um, that would be step three. Step four would be VIP, um, you know, which is the video inspection probe. So we would then, um, if there was no damage there, we would look at the end of the connector uh, end face to see if there was any kind of damage to the end of the connector end face. So these types of tools all typically um, able to be purchased separately, but depending on what you're trying to do, and if you have a uniform process and procedures that your technicians are supposed to follow, um, they can work very well together and also be included all in one unit um, to, uh, to perform an extremely efficient, uh, efficiently together and, um, and uh, also uh, handle the, the requirements that, that are needed. So um, those are just some options. Again, you know, that's, that's an example of why you might want to see some of these other features included. Um, then again, the, the support issue. Um, if you have problems in the field, um, where are you going to get support? Do you have local sales reps who can come out and uh, teach you how to use the unit? I think that's an incredibly important uh, component of it. Otherwise, I think probably some of the overseas manufacturers would probably dominate the market right now because of price, but they just don't have that local support um, to help some of the customers work through issues, get warranties, you know, you know problems, getting it fixed. Uh, calibration is also another thing when you talk about support is, you know, a lot of these pieces of equipment need to be calibrated every year. So if you're looking at a one-year calibration, you know, and you have to ship it overseas to get calibrated every year, then that's going to be a, a huge cost and probably not worth the, worth the hassle. Anything you would save, you'd probably lose in, in um, the transportation and uh, extra fees associated with the calibration. So um, all very good things to take into consideration and make sure you have answers to when you're evaluating your product. Um, so what will you need to test? Um, as we, we talked about kind of briefly as, as the, the first item in there, what are the wavelengths that I'll need? Well, what will I need to be testing? Back to the, the idea here of single mode versus multi-mode. So as I mentioned you know, previously, multi-mode, which is going to be our premise uh, type applications, typically we're going to see 850 nanometers and 1300 nanometers. Um, Again, we're looking at the two wavelengths here because what we're trying to see is the um, one of these wavelengths will be the uh, wavelength that we will operate under, right? So we'll need to make sure that if we're operating at 850, we want to know what does the fiber um, look like, how clean is the fiber at that particular wavelength. So we'll want to make sure we use that as one of the measurements. But we also want to use this second wavelength as a way of creating a, um, a reference for a macro bend. So one of the big problems we have with fiber is bending of fiber. We get loss or attenuation. Okay. Normally, the higher the wavelength, um, the better it will perform with uh, fusion splice loss and things of that nature. But it's inversely um, related when it comes to bending. So the higher the wavelength, actually the more attenuation will get when you bend it. So with the 850, 
we'll be able to get a pretty clear reference of what the fiber looks like at 850. But if we see a certain location on that fiber you know, test or that, uh, that OTDR shot, the trace, where the 1300 nanometer wavelength actually has a higher drop off or a higher amount of loss at a particular event than at the 850, well then we actually know we have a macro band at that in that uh, location and that's something that we'll probably want to clean up. So that's why we'll say we'll need 850 and 1300 so um, always recommending those two wavelengths standard single mode uses as i said 1310 1550 um, but as we'll see here where we get into a little bit more detail than i did in the previous slide is every now and then the the standard single mode starts to get a little bit more complicated and we'll see certain circumstances where we've added additional wavelengths that may not have been um, standard, you know, let's say 10, 15 years ago. Um, so the first example of that will be the fiber to the home, FTTX application, where we'll sometimes see this 1490 uh, wavelength uh, come into play. And what that 1490 is, is actually the signal, the transport uh, signal for the um, uh, internet as it um, comes down from the head end. Okay, so our Ethernet traffic is going to come down to our NID at that 1490. Now from the house, what we're typically going to do is shoot up towards the head end. Any kind of information we would need to send back, we will transmit at that 1310 uh, nanometer wavelength. So um, what we're trying to illustrate you know, here is you got the 1490 coming down, you got the 1310 going over back up the same fiber. So those two different wavelengths allow us to use the same fiber um, and transmit data in two directions. And then the 1550 nanometer wavelength here is what is reserved for um, what's called our um, RF signal. So for our uh, television uh, signal, a lot of those original television signals came with RF. So it's RF over fiber and those were transmitted at this 1550 yeah, nanometer wavelength. So if you have a fiber to the home where it's using RF uh, over fiber, then um, you would use that 1550. If it's IPTV, then you might actually um, not need that 1550 wavelength and you might just be operating at 1310, 1490. Um, so just something to you know, take into consideration if you've got a fiber to the home application, you know, do you need to consider that 1490? Um, then DWDM, uh, Dense Wavelength Division Multiplexing. What we're doing here is we're looking at the uh, range um, you know, within the uh, optical spectrum where we can transmit multiple signals, kind of like we did with the 1310, 1490, 1550, all on the same fiber, but at different frequencies, they won't interfere. We have the same ability to do this at 1550, 1551, 1552, 1553. Now the spacing will you know, be different, you know, but it just is an example. Um, we can we can separate these very very down to like 0.2 nanometer in in, in difference. Um, so in that scenario, a lot of times what we're looking for is that 1550 um, you know wavelength, and because of the distances of a lot of those. The 1310 has too much loss that we typically have to bump up to like a 1625 nanometer wavelength to get the distances. So this is potentially, a, again, a DWDM system might be a, a core you know, core backbone for AT&T, Verizon, someone like that, where they need to get a lot of uh, telephone calls, data, you know, transmissions and all that stuff over one single fiber. They've got it all spaced out over very small um, density dense wavelength division multiplexing um, spacing um, and you want to be able to jump into that 1625 to test those fibers while they're performing um, you know at the 1550 wavelength or potentially because the 1625 uh, nanometer wavelength is actually pretty close to the top end of where the DWDM um, you know operating range is we're starting to see customers uh, specifically the cable television customers Time Warner and others um, just came out and requested a quad OTDR with 1310, 1550, 1625, and then a 1650 um, nanometer filtered wavelength. So what that is is 
on that 1650 uh, wavelength, they want us to actually put a filter in the front of that to filter out anything other than the 1650 wavelength so that we can test um, the, the, the fibers while they're in operation and not interfere with um, any signaling uh, and things of that nature. Um, and because we, we can get so close to, to that range, um, you know, at the 1625, we want to put a little bit more cushion or spacing between, um, you know, the upper end of the DWGM spectrum and, and the 1625. We bumped that up to 1650. And uh, that's something that we're seeing a little bit more of, um, you know, nowadays is that 1650. Um, so live fiber testing, you know, do, do I need that? You know, it's a very, very big question because, again, that's not something that can be changed after the fact. You need to put a filter on that port um, to make sure you're taking the transmission that could be shooting down directly into your OTDR and filter that out so that you don't damage the receiver. Because if you know about OTDR technology, we're sending a light down a fiber and looking at very, 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 very small um, uh, reflections on microscopic particles in the fiber. So it's very, very highly uh, sensitive and highly tuned. You know, if someone was sending a signal directly down the, uh, the fiber towards us, their power is so strong that it'll actually burn out the receiver. So we got to make sure that we're filtering out power that is not the power that we're trying to measure. So uh, if you want live fiber testing, you need to make sure you talk to your, your sales uh, rep about that and make sure you get that, that put in there correctly. Um, or do we need uh, all, all wavelengths, a quad? That's what I was telling you about earlier. Typically, we're not going to see too many more than like you know, these four. Now, there is some CWDM, you know, that have four wavelengths or eight wavelengths on an OTDR. Um, uh, there's even tunable OTRs that are coming out, which are a little bit higher uh, in, in cost. But, you know, a quad, when we talk about quad, we're really talking about an OTDR that has four wavelengths pre-configured on it. So that's just something that you might hear in, in, uh, in kind of the terms when, uh, when discussing things with kind of sales reps. So... So how does an OTDR measure distance is one of the things I just kind of talked about, you know, briefly, and it's incredibly important to understand so that uh, as you're kind of going through and making some of these decisions, you, you know what to look for. So an OTDR is basically going to send a pulse of light down the fiber and, like I said, look for very microscopic reflections um, off of the intrinsic particles uh, inherent in the fiber. So to measure, um, you know, that's... That's that's how it um, that's how it measures the loss and and the distance. But also, if it's looking for these reflections um, to measure the distance, it needs to know a couple other factors. One is the speed of light. So what we're talking about here is we're talking about sending light down the fiber in one direction and looking for reflections back. So we're really looking at a time, right? We send something out, it reflects off of something and comes back. So if we take half of the amount of time that it took to get back to the receiver, that's about the amount of time it took to get out to that end point, right? So if we know the speed of light and then divide, that the light is traveling and divide it in half, that'll give us a good indication of our distance. So it's one of the calculations that we use, you know, for the OTDR. Um, and then the time it took for the light to travel down the fiber and return is the elapsed time. Um, and that'll also, um, you know, be an important, you know, a factor along with the test pulse width. So um, it's not necessarily the speed of light um, that we're, that's needed, but it's typically what's called the index of refraction of the glass. So the IOR of the glass, which is going to, um, when we set that on the OTDR, and we want to make sure it is something we can set on the OTDR, when we set that on the OTDR, we're saying the speed of light through a vacuum, you know, uh, you know uh, void of any air or anything like that, vacuum, empty space, is known. But it travels different th differently through air, water, um, glass, all these things. So depending on the type of glass we're going to use, we're going to make sure we use the, the appropriate index of refraction setting so that we, you know, we give the OTDR the correct speed at which it's traveling. So when it does lop that time in half, it has an accurate measurement of, of the distance and how far that fiber got before it was reflected back to, you know, uh, or how far the light got before it was reflected back. So that allows us to know the distance to that particular fault. So that's, um, you know, that, that, that brings in a little bit more kind of uh, high level concepts of how OTDR is used. But like I said, you need to know that and you need to know how the IOR comes into play there. Um, 
Typical OTDR traces, uh, what you're going to see when you're looking at a trace. Um, here's an example of what you would see. Um, not a big, big fan of this particular um, uh, trace because it doesn't depict um, something that I really think every OTDR uh, trace should depict. And I'm not sure why it advanced there. Hold on one second. Let's go back. Let's slow I don't know if it's timed or what, maybe mistakenly timed. Um, we're looking at the launch, and then we're looking at the reflective uh, event. So one of the things that I was saying is we typically always want to use a launch box. So you know, what I would like to see on this OTDR trace is the launch, which is correct. And then we call this second spike a reflective event. Well, that's... In, that's completely accurate. Uh, it is a reflective event, you know, therefore we see that, you know, uh, typical spike that we would want to see at a reflective event. But what I'm really thinking of here too is we should really call this area between the launch and this first reflective event, I would like to see it de depicted as the, um, the launch box or the pulse suppressor box. This would typically be a one kilometer length of fiber that we would use to kind of get the OTDR in its um, optimal calibration range. Uh, I always use the example of a flashlight uh, pointed in somebody's eye. If we're, you know, we're talking about optics and I take a flashlight and I point it right in somebody's eye, your eyes are flooded with light and information and we really can't see beyond uh, the, the flashlight that's pointed at us. But if I take that flashlight and I move it to the far end of a, a football field 100, 100 meters away, uh, 100 yards away, um, I can see that light, I can kind of look at that light and I can see past that because I haven't flooded my, uh, my eyes um, you know, with, um, with, with the light. So what we are doing with the launch box is essentially similar to that. If we launch right into the first connector of the fiber under test, I really don't get a very accurate measurement for the first couple, you know, 100 meters of that fiber. Um, and I certainly you know, don't get a very good measurement of that first connector. So by putting that launch box in place, what I get is I get to back that fiber up 100 meters if it was multi-mode or maybe a, uh, one kilometer if it's single mode. I back that up and I'm able to get a more accurate reading of that first connector. And that's incredibly important because if that first connector is damaged um, and we have this huge drop off of launch, you know, at launch, which is, you know, fairly typical, um, we're really not getting a very good reading and we're not really being able to identify that there's a problem with that connector the same way we would if we connected to a launch box you know at the at the end and, and then can you know get a more accurate um, reading of that um, completely agree with the the reflective event call here so the reflective event could be a couple things it could be a connector um, but we don't call it a connector because we don't see it we can't we can't necessarily be 100% certain it's a connector. Uh, potentially it's a mechanical splice. Uh, maybe it's a, a, a little crack in the fiber or something like that. Most of the time I would say it's probably a connector, but we like to refer to them as reflective events until we're sure and want to, uh, you, know, um, you know, completely confirm that that is a, is a connector in that particular location. Um, other things that we see on here is what's called a non-reflective event. So the non-reflective event is really a bend or maybe a bad splice um, in the fiber. We're not sure. Um, not by looking at one wavelength, which again we have here. Now where I'd like to see this maybe having two wavelengths uh, in here, so two, two traces kind of overlapping each other because that's where we really get to see you know, the 1310 compared to the 1550 wavelength or the, the 850 compared to the 1300 wavelength and be able to determine this non-reflective event. Is that a bad splice or is that a macro bend? Based on the information here, I really can't tell you um, until I had a little bit more information to be able to diagnose that. And that would be that second uh, trace file. Um, and then the end event. You know, typically the end event is going to be a very, very highly reflective event because there's... Um, the fiber uh, or the light is actually leaving the fiber and hitting air, uh, which creates a huge reflective event. So we have a very high spike there, followed by a very large drop, and then the noise floor. So these are all accurate depictions of events that we would potentially see on an OTDR trace, 
but I think that there's always um, you know a few other things that you know could be added to here and uh, are probably more indicative of what we would see if we were looking at a trace on a true OTDR versus just kind of a, a, a graphical representation. So those are things to, to look at. And when we're talking about the OTDR and selecting it, the accuracy at which these OTDRs can read these reflective events and how much reflection is coming off these events is a, is a huge factor. Okay. So again, uh, looking a little bit more at the multi-mode environment, you know, what we have depicted here is, a, again, an office environment um, because typically the multi-mode systems are going to operate in this 850, 1300 nanometer wavelength. They're going to be between floors or between buildings. Um, they're going to be indoors, very short distance applications, horizontal links, um, you know, between buildings or, or um, between floors. So it's not going to be a lot, of, a very long run. It's going to be a shorter run. So your dynamic range can be a little bit, um, a little bit lower. You don't need like a 40 dB OTDR for multi-mode. You'll never shoot that far. You'll never have multi-mode that travels that far because, um, you know, from a, the uh, industry specifications, it's really meant to be uh, at a maximum of like two kilometers, um, you know, that you would have. And even at that, it's really expecting like 10 um, megabits uh, per second transmission rate at that. So you're looking at maybe fire suppression systems, uh, signaling systems, you know, uh, for for signs or something like that. You know, very, very low bandwidth applications that you'd be looking at. So, um and, you know, the multi-mode core, as we show you over here, is about 62.5. It's about half the diameter of the fiber, which is 125. So that's showing the cladding and the core size relative to each other on a multi-mode. So um, when, you're, when you're looking at your system, you really can't use a multi-mode OTDR and mate it up against a single-mode OTDR because the core sizes won't align, and therefore you won't get accurate measurements. So you need to make sure you, you know what you're looking for um, at the time that the... Uh, the um, units are, are purchased. Single mode uh, to kind of represent the fact that we're, you know single mode is going to be their long haul applications. Seeing much much more um, single mode applications in the um, uh, premise environments as well um, between buildings and, and even on campus now. For a long time that wasn't the case just because the cost of single mode uh, was so much more expensive. The LEDs that we use to launch into a um, multi-mode uh, fiber ha were a lot less expensive than the single mode um, you know, transmitters and receivers. Um, so there was some advantage and cost savings on the short haul to uh, to use multi-mode. But we're seeing, you know, as as more and more mass manufacturing occurs. We're seeing more and more single mode being applied into all aspects, just so you don't have to worry about upgrading. Because there's a lot of environments, especially campus environments that we've worked on with, uh, where they used to use multi mode as their network, but then um, you know over buildings when they were trying to just do 10 meg, you know between buildings. But now you know when they're trying to do 10 gig between buildings or 100 gig. Um, they needed to move to single mode, and they moved their fire suppression and some of their security systems onto that uh, that old multi-mode fiber. Um, outside plan, WAN, and long haul applications. Again, all you know uh, things that I've kind of alluded to, you know, here already. The fiber to the home wavelengths, uh, as we talked about, um, you know, previously we've got the 1310 nanometer used for the return path. 1490 for your voice and data downstream, as I said, and then the 1550 for that downstream video. So those are those are just another um, you know, way of kind of highlighting those comments that I already made earlier about why we would need those particular wavelengths for fiber to the home and, and how each one of those is is used uh, kind of currently. So um, and and here's an example of what we're talking about with the um, the DWDM you know systems. So the the graph here, which is important, shows this th between 1350 and about 1400. Um, you know, there's this huge black spike in the uh, loss of fiber attenuation curve. So that's why for a long time, if you look at the O band, which is the lower band of, on the optical um, spectrum, the O band 1310 was the lowest point. Uh, or the lowest amount of fiber attenuation on that side of that uh, that water peak that was that was created by the water uh, hydrogen molecules um, you know that were in, in, intrinsic in the fiber you know throughout the manufacturing process and then 1550 was actually the low point on the opposite side of that water peak so we use 1310 and we use 1550 
because those were the we got the best distance uh, and loss performance at those two wavelengths. But now, as you see, if we're moving up into 16-channel DWDM or 8-channel DWDM, um, you know, and we're using the uh, C band and L band, if we're only using the C band, then we could get into um, doing our fiber monitoring on the 1625 L band. Um, but as we've started to see, as you see that second larger circle for the 18 and DWD or 16 and DWDM channels, we're getting up into the 1600 L band. Um, uh, wavelengths that we're using to transmit uh, signal over. So that's where we're looking to potentially bump up to that U band and use that 1650 you know, nanometer to get that appropriate um, spacing. So the typical DWDM spacing, as you see, you know, here is, um, you know, uh, 0.8 nanometer is what we can get to for, um, you know, for our 40 channel 100 gigahertz, um, you know, uh, modulation there and um, that's that's something that uh, you know is incredibly advantageous when you got companies that are trying to put like 16 terabits of data over one singular fiber um, really for the most part we're looking at systems that are trying to do a hundred meg and now they're, they're actually got systems that are trying to do 400 uh, I'm sorry 400 uh, 100 gig trying to do 400 gig but even the ones that are doing a hundred gig right now a lot of them are multiplexing um, 10, 10 gig channels to kind of get up to the to the 100 gig um, you know data rates. So um, you know if you're looking to do you know 16 terabits and you're trying to get all that um, all that uh, bandwidth on one single fiber, you've got to be able to get up to those 40 channels with very very tight spacing um, and very very high uh, bandwidth. So the crosstalk and some of the other stuff that uh, you know is potential hazards there. Um, are all things that need to be, you know, considered when you're putting that kind of, you know, uh, traffic, you know, on there. But um, make sure that you're looking at those bandwidths. You're making sure you're understanding if you want to do uh, live monitoring of fibers that you're up. If you're doing DWDM, I really recommend you bump up to the 1650. Uh, even though you get a little less loss, um, uh, performance, you know, there because you start to tick up. It's still um, relatively um, effective, you know, measurement, and you can still get pretty good distance. But you also get a pretty nice uh, separation between the other wavelengths that we're we're operating under. Um, one of the other factors is the uh, ferrule. So when you're looking at your OTDR, um, you need to understand and make sure that the ferrule that you're connecting um, against is appropriately polished. So in this picture here, we have a hybrid jumper, which is taking it from an SCAPC, which is green, to an SCUPC, which is uh, blue. And the difference is that APC connector actually is an angled uh, ferrule, which is an eight degree angle um, to reduce back reflections on systems that are like fiber home systems that are maybe using 1550 for their, um, uh, uh, RF signal, their video uh, signal, and um, you know that has a lot of reflections that come back, and the reflections cause a lot of bit error rate uh, problems for at the 1550 wavelengths if there's a lot of reflections in the system. So what they do is they put that little APC on there, and that that minimizes the amount of reflections that are occurring. Very nice feature, but you can't plug a blue connector against a green. Um, port and get that to mate correctly. You're not you're not making a true contact at that point. So you're not going to get an accurate test if you haven't uh, made sure you're mating uh, appropriately. So make sure you have your hybrid patch cables um, in your box. Make sure that, you're, let's say your launch box is APC. Well, if you're mating up against a UPC, you're going to need another jumper to kind of convert that over to uh, to make a good connection uh, against the port uh, that you're, you're, you're mating up against. So know your angle, know your connector, and uh, you know, make sure that uh, if you're using any kind of APCs, you have the, um, the appropriate um, APC polish on your OTDR. The distance, um, well, when we talk about distance, everybody likes to say, well, I need an OTDR that'll shoot 100 kilometers. Well, you know, it's not like the OTDR is meant to shoot a certain amount. Um, again, I use the idea from that everybody, you know, hopefully understands is, um, you know, I use headlights in the fog, okay? So if you tell me you want headlights that can shoot, you know, five kilometers or, you know, five miles down the road, 
you know, sure, on a crystal clear night, you got lights that'll shoot, you know, five kilometers down the road. But I say if it's if it's foggy and you're in, you know, uh, a real low-lying damp area and, and the visibility is low, I mean, I've been out where sometimes you can't see 100 yards in front of you. So the power of the light did not change. The amount of um, refract, uh, refraction and reflections that are occurring based on particles that the light is trying to travel past has increased, and that affects the distance. Well, the same is true with an OTDR. The dynamic range is really um, you know, the amount of power that the OTDR has in it. But if you are operating in a, uh, on a fiber that is uh, very, very dirty, has a lot of bad connectors in it and, and high loss because of bad splices, you're only able to go as far as uh, the, the amount of power that you have left. So let's say we're, we're launching, we've got you know, 32 dB, we launch, we come out of the, the launch cable and we have you know, negative 0.75 dB loss. Well, then you have to take that out of the equation. And then you go another couple meters and you've got a bad fusion splice that's maybe 3 dB. Well, then you have to take that out of the equation. So each event that you run into is absorbing power, and that's going to affect your total distance. So that's just something you need to take into consideration. Ask about a dynamic range. Know the power, but then also know uh, typically what you're trying to measure um, so that you know if you're going to be able to get that full full distance. Um, measurement range is really one of the things that you need to kind of take into consideration. So what we're trying to show here is a, a, you need to subtract about 8 dB from the dynamic range to make sure that you're able to accurately measure uh, the fiber under test because your noise floor is going to come into play and I'll show you that on the next um, on the next sc screen. But um, you know you take that dynamic range and you have to probably subtract about 8 dB to make sure that you've got uh, you know, enough separation between your noise floor and any kind of events that are trying to be measured. Um, so that's an important factor. Um, so again, you need to make sure you select an OTDR with the module that has the dynamic range of wavelengths that you're looking for. So when you're looking, let's just say we were trying to do a 100 kilometer span, right? If we're trying to do a 100 kilometer span, if we're measuring at 1310 nanometers, we're typically going to have about 0.35 dB per kilometer loss intrinsic in the fiber. That means the no splicing, no connectors, no nothing. Just as we're going down the fiber, the light is being absorbed in the particles at about 0.35 dB per kilometer. Okay, so if that's the case, um, and then we have other factors that come into play, like um, you know splices, connectors, things of that nature, then we're really going to uh, impede the amount of um, you know, how how far we're able to shoot. But if we're able to go, um, uh, let's what did I say? With 13. Um, 0.35. We're going to have, if we try to go 0.35 um, and we we're trying to do 100 kilometers, that's basically 35 dB of total range that we would need right there. Um, so if we take the 8 dB um, uh, you know, kind of overhead that we want to look at here, we're really looking at needing about a 43 dB OTDR to, uh, to be able to accurately measure you know, that kind of distance. So that's a high-powered OTDR, 43 dB. You, know, you can get 40. You can get even up to 50. They're, they're very expensive, uh, but you can get it. So one of the other things that we could do here is instead of measuring at 1310, we can measure at 1550. Okay, so if we measure at 1550, we have about a 0.22 dB per uh, kilometer uh, loss. So again, if we were to measure the same 100 kilometer span and uh, we have 0.22, that's only going to absorb about 22 dB of power you know, over the, that length. So if we add the uh, 8 dB of overhead into there, we're really only needing about a 30 dB OTDR, which is a very, very comfortable range. You know, typically we're not even going to sell OTDRs that um, come in below like 34, 32 nowadays. So, um, you know, you just need to make sure that you're, you're looking at, if you're going to measure above like I'd say 60, 70 kilometers, I really recommend an OTDR which is maybe 1550 and 1625 because you're going to get that extra distance at a lower uh, power output. So that's just something um, that you need to kind of work. And again, you know, give us a call, talk to us, you know, tell us what you're trying to accomplish and we'll be able to walk you through that. Um, 
But in this kind of picture here, this is what we're trying to illustrate is this dynamic range. So between the two circle, two blue lines here, the one on the top where the arrow is, you know, that comes in at about 26, 27 dB, runs all the way across, all the way down to the bottom, which is to zero. Um, uh, that's, that's the full dynamic range of an OTDR. Um, and the difference between um, the the dynamic range and what we talked about with our measurement range, uh, our measurement range here is really going to be the area which we see how the noise comes in. It starts to get kind of noisy over here at around 8 dB. Well, at around 8 dB, anything beyond that, we're really not getting an accurate, clear measurement of what the event looks like because the noise is, is is really masking a lot of that. So um, what we're trying to illustrate here is the measurement range is the difference between the dynamic range and about that 8 dB um, of, of power, uh, 8 dBm, I guess, if you want to say is a power um, measurement or 8 dB of loss. So you need to take that into consideration when you're coming up with some of your numbers because you've got this launch, this green area on the far left. You've got that launch. It's going to drop down, uh, you know, a half a dB or so for that launch. And then you've got from that point at which it enters the fiber down to um, about 8 d dBm um, as, your, uh, as your measurement range. And then some of the other uh, features that I talked about already, um, you know, built-in power meters, um, visual fault locators, inspection probes, um, uh, IOLM or uh, some sort of trace, you know, analysis, you know, configure uh, software, um, Wi-Fi connectivity and cloud-based storage are just some of the other, you know, factors that we'll, that we'll uh, want to consider. And in here, you know, the built-in power meter, most testing today calls for a power meter and light source to be used in addition to an OTDR. An OTDR is great, but there's really only one true method of uh, measuring loss, and that's core power. So inserting light on one side and receiving it on the other. Um, because other things can be manipulated with settings, incorrect settings, and things of that nature. So, you know, it probably makes sense to just get a built-in power meter on your OTDR. What I like about it is it allows you to save the test results of the power meter setting right on the same o uh, device as the OTDR so that you have all your record keeping in one place. It's, it's, we test thousands of fibers, you know, a year uh, all across the country in a high, very high-level test called uh, fiber characterization. And it's always fantastic to have all that measurement on one, one unit. Um, so the power meters uh, and light sources can be built into the OTDR to reduce the number of items carried. The way that they integrate the light source typically is going to be the same source as the uh, OTDR source. Okay? An OTDR source is pulsing to get um, uh, uh, measurements um, back and forth. Uh, you know, it pulses at a certain frequency um, to allow uh, it to get... Uh, more clarity over the fiber. Now, when it goes into laser light source mode to be worked with the power meter, it's going into a steady hold pattern. It's just turning it on and holding at a consistent uh, um, uh, power uh, setting, and, and uh, it doesn't flash at all, so there's no frequency. So it just it, it becomes a stable light source at that time. So that works out um, and allows you to leverage some existing equipment that you have to uh, get an accurate measurement. So. Very, very possible to integrate a power mirror and light source into your OTR. Um, visual fault locator, probably one of the best tools you can get. Um, this one, if you got as a separate standalone tool, I'm actually very, very comfortable with that because there's just so much you can do with it. And I, we have very small pen style um, VFLs that I really recommend. They're great. Every technician who's doing fiber should really use that. But if you're going to you know, have an OTDR, might as well get that added to, to the equation as well so that you can. I, you know, the only reason I say it doesn't have to be part of it is because it really doesn't take any measurements. You don't save any results with a VFL, but certainly does a number of things for you. Um, some of those things identify bends. So that's kind of the second picture from the from left to right on the top there. If you bend the fiber, you're going to be able to see that fiber glow. Locate breaks. Certainly going to, to do that for you. Detect any kind of breaks in the fiber where it'll glow. Verify continuity. Um, you know what you're looking for there with the verifying continuity is you're looking to go at the far end of the fiber. Do you see 
the light coming out of the far end, um, which you should if there were no breaks. So it's you like tone for copper. You know, uh, VFL works the same way to see if you've got continuity on it. And the end identification. Now, a lot of times what will happen is you'll have a splice that happens somewhere mid mid. Uh, you know, mid-span. So you got a one kilometer, you know, span and somewhere in between blue was, you know, spliced to black because it was dark at night and nobody, you know, could tell the difference. So it was misspliced. So when you put it on the blue on one side, it comes out the black on the other. Um, that's a very good end-to-end -end identifier. Um, uh, and, and building it in means fewer items to carry. Um, you know, some of the other things that I'd, I also identify, it detects scratches, I think, on a connector. So one of the things that I've been able to do is put it on the back of a connector. Um, and if, don't point it at your eye, but you point it up in the air, straight up into the air. And if you look at it at a 90-degree angle, like from the side, if there's a little star at the top of your, your ferrule, um, there's dirt or debris there. You, if you wipe that clean, you shouldn't see any kind of star or reflection right at that point. There's a way of, if I didn't have a, a microscope, I've actually been able to clean connectors or tell whether they were dirty by actually looking at it um, and detecting scratches or, or debris on the end of the connector. Um, so just very, very good ways of using a, a visual fault locator. So if you can get it built onto the OTDR, why not? Um, video ins inspection probes. Um, here's an example of a Fluke uh, handheld inspection scope that stands alone. But again, if you can build that into the OTDR, what you get is um, you know this nice depiction on the OTDR of what the uh, what that fiber end face would look like, and that's a good indication there that um, you've got a very clean fiber. Um, there's no scratches. There's no debris. There's nothing on that uh, connector end face which would be impeding the uh, performance and and cause any kind of result you know problems. Certainly, an OTDR that is dirty will give you bad results. You, you, you will mess with the trace. So if you go out and shoot it and it's dirty, you're, you know, bad, bad data in, bad data out. It's not going to be accurate. So always make sure before you connect your OTDR to any device, you always want to make sure that you've inspected the connector end face so that you're not going to damage the, your, your, the connections that you're making uh, and cause permanent you know, damage. Um, so, you know, link view system or other uh, IOLM or smart OTR type systems. So, um, there's three out there that I would recommend, and I do think it's worth, you know, buying o OTDRs that have these. And this is, again, a separation between, um, you know, probably Precision Rated Optics, Expo, Viavi, uh, and some of the cheap OTDRs that you're going to buy overseas is this link view technology. Um, where you can actually get a graphical representation of what's viewed in the field. Oh, I'm sorry, viewed in the trace. I absolutely require that my guys have access to the OTDR trace because all of these systems make, make errors. It's not 100%. It's not foolproof. Don't go by the link view system. Great reference. Get a quick straight line map of what you think is going on. But there's very, very frequently you get... Um, a APC connectors misrepresented as bends or um, splice events because uh, the reflections are so low because of that angled polish. So it'll put a connector, you know, or it'll put a splice somewhere that it really is a connector. And um, that actually can confuse people because it's guessing at what it thinks it is. Um, and if you can't go back and look at the original OTDR trace, um, you'll actually wind up, you know, miss uh, documenting your, your, your spans and, and, and that could cause all kinds of other problems. But do like this for the novice who doesn't know what they're looking at. Um, and again, this was the part of this link view system as part of that uh, OBL or poor man's OTDR that um, you know, was delivered to Cablevision from the Pro Solution. Um, where they had that special process that they wanted to, to kind of go through. So, again, first it was the power meter reading. Second was throw it on link view to see if it saw anything. Um, if it did, they were supposed to go to the OTDR view to kind of, you know, double check the analysis that came up and then go through those uh, additional sequences of uh, troubleshooting events. So, uh, good, good software. Recommend uh, one of these solutions for sure. Um, does the client have any requirements, you know, saying that they want uh, Smart View or Link View or um, IOLM or anything like those uh, that goes along those? So you might want to make sure that your, your customer doesn't have any requirement for those. Um, um, Wi-Fi connectivity. Becoming an increasingly um, uh, requested uh, feature. Again, not something a lot of the um, overseas OTDRs have, um, but if you can get it, um, I would because it makes uh, life a little bit easier. One of the things that we're offering at fiberoptic.com is this 
uh, management of OTDR traces. So what you can actually do from your OTDR is upload it uh, via the Fiber Connect software right into a centralized database that will allow you to store and document your network. So you know, if you can get that Wi-Fi connectability, um, that's a great feature and I would certainly recommend it. Also, if you can't, um, one of the things we're showing here is um, you know, you can also plug into a tablet that has Wi-Fi at least and use that, that tablet as a way of connecting back into, uh, into the system and uploading your traces. Because what typically happens is somebody goes out, shoots it, uh, gets saved as a PDF and then never used again. But if you put it as part of your network documentation platform like Fiberbase, and then it's always there and it's in the system you're constantly using um, so you can kind of identify any kind of degradation over time or, or any issues that, uh, that, that might uh, eventually occur that, um, you know, if it was just a PDF somewhere and you ignored it, um, you really wouldn't be keeping on top of proactively um, identifying what might be causing some, you know, uh, degradation. So. Um, Cloud-based solution, again, here's kind of a, a picture, uh, again, three kind of players, um, Fiberbase um, and, and Fiber Connect from Precision Rated Optics, Xfo has Xfo Connect, and Viavi has uh, Stratasync. Um, again, the solution here is you've got this gentleman in the field, he's got this tablet with this tablet, he's selecting his project, um, and then selecting the files and uploading the files right into a project um, so that it's stored and managed and the project managers can uh, keep track of that. And then uh, over time, you know, with Fiberbase Connect versus Xfo Connect or Stratasync, the, the Fiberbase Connect is actually connected to a map um, type of application which if you put your two endpoints into the, uh, to the map like Google Maps or something like that, you can see those two locations, then uh, it'll draw a straight line between your two, uh, your starting point and your end point. But over time, if you actually knew where that path of that fiber went, you could actually drag that along uh, street routes and um, and uh, get the exact location of uh, any kind of bends or something like that. So starts off with uploading it to a project. The project will have two endpoints. It'll be straight line, you know, for, for immediately. But then you can go back into the full Fiberbase application, not through Fiberbase Connect, but through the full Fiberbase application, and you can actually draw the uh, the conduit pass and then drop and um, re re. Um, direct the fibers to follow the path that it actually does follow in the field, um, which makes, again, troubleshooting in the future uh, much easier. Because an OTDR will show you where um, loss occurs, but if that's not mapped to a physical uh, GPS coordinate, um, all you have is distance, and you're going to have to kind of drive that distance until you can figure out where that is. So cloud storage is uh, uh, definitely, you know, extra cost, but, you know, probably, you know, make sure you have platforms that are worth um, investing in because in you know next couple of years this is where it's going. Uh, support, what support will you need? Obviously that's like I said training. You know what kind of training do you require? We're able to train uh, customers on uh, Expo, Biavi, AFL, uh, Precision Rated Optics, and Ritsu. Uh, so any kind of OTDR support that you need, we can certainly uh, help you out with. That's not a problem there. Uh, we can provide maintenance, uh, calibration. We can do all kinds of support there. Uh, we can come out and do field training if needed. So from a support standpoint, I think we can pretty much, you know, cover you. Um, but you might also want some manufacturer support and warranties and things of that nature that you may want to look into. Certainly makes sense to probably go with a three-year warranty. Um, again, we do a lot of testing. I'd spend the money for the extra warranty. We do a lot of testing. These things are uh, sometimes 10 feet in the air at the top of a rack where we're climbing up a ladder and you know this thing gets dropped off there and um, you know things happen. So uh, if you can get a warranty that will support you for three years, I think that probably makes some sense as well. Um, again, a word about the launch boxes. You know, certainly when looking at your your options, make sure you take uh, the the launch box into consideration. Uh, again, this will allow you to analyze that first connector. Um, and uh, you know, this is an example on the bottom is a um, a launch box, a launch bag uh, by Precision Rated Optics where you can kind of uh, get your leads and they come right out of the bag and it works kind of well. You can put your cleaning supplies in there. They also have a hardened um, uh, 
launch box, which is in a Pelican case, which works well too. But uh, you know, we're seeing uh, more and more interest in this bag approach because it can be used to store um, you know, fiber cleaning supplies and things of that nature. Some of the problems with the Pelican case is if the guys aren't careful, they'll actually crimp down on that um, three millimeter uh, you know, zip cord there and crack the fiber under there and then they'll have to send it back for repair. So that's just one of the downsides to that versus the zipper. Yeah, you might start to zip it up, but you're not going to you know, really crack the fiber within there. So that bag, you know, bag style is really nice and we're seeing uh, uh, good feedback on that. But definitely, oh, and there's actually the OBL I was telling you about in the picture here, uh, OBL 301. That's that single wavelength brake locator, um, but has multiple functions kind of built into it. Really, really good price great entry level OTDR slash brake locator. Um, but also even a brake locator, definitely recommend the OTDR um, launch box uh, to be used with that to make sure that you're you're getting clear um, depiction of what's going on in the field on that first connector. Otherwise, it's really hard to troubleshoot these things um, when you don't have a launch box because uh, if there's dirt and debris on that first connector, we can't measure it. We just we you start to assume it's equipment failures. You start to make all these assumptions that just you know maybe aren't true. Um, illustration of particle migration. So this is one of the things that we're talking about. Why use a launch box? Why use cleaning supplies? Always, 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 always inspect your connector, clean your connector, and use a launch box. Um, each time the connectors are mated, you'll see the particles move around the core, causing them to get, um, you know, uh, air gaps, you know, between the fibers and dirt and debris and particles, you know, uh, smashed and damaged uh, the, the end ferrule. So this is showing the first one. We make a connection. Uh, we smashed against that. We took big particles uh, after the first mate um, and, and broke them up, shattered them spread them further across the ferrule and then uh, got them to uh, to re um, you know uh, kind of rest on the on the connector end face um, and, and but we got our measurement it wasn't great we're looking at it we forgot to clean again so we're going to mate up again and then the second time boom smash it again so this is now our second mating we've broken up those particles again um, you know started to probably do some permanent damage to the connector there and uh, you know, now I'm probably going to have a very difficult time cleaning this up and um, getting to get an accurate you know, measurement. Uh, make, making it again, um, you start to see as that uh, fiber started to leave, we actually started to depict a little bit of a fracture in the core there. Now we've got uh, you know, glass and shards and dirt and debris all over the, the center of the core where transmission occurs, and we've got probably fractured um, you know, core uh, which is really where the light travels and uh, is not going to allow us to create accurate measurements. So as you can see then we go and we you know make this fourth measurement we've got all this particle in there and these particles are actually holding the fibers apart from each other not allowing us to get a, a clean mating and uh, probably going to get a very poor launch and therefore bad results of our tests uh, on this. So definitely make sure you clean and make sure you're inspecting um, you know, after you clean, that, that verifies everything is uh, ready to go and you can mate your two ferrules together. Connector cleaning should be relatively simple. Um, you know, all you need is some uh, alcohol. Um, these cleaning sticks down here, the CS125 and the CS-250, uh, work really well. You just take the cap off, stick it in there. It does a wipe of the end face of the ferrule and uh, cleans all that debris and takes it out. Uh, rather than just mushing it around in there and, and getting it to spread around uh, on the fiber end face, it'll actually get in there and clean it and remove it um, by spinning and rot and it's kind of like a dental floss, but it kind of spins over um, the end of the the tip of the the cleaning device and also rotates around in like a 360 degrees. So it's spinning and advancing all at the same time, which basically causes a wiping action away and removes that dirt and debris from the from the ferrule. So um, make sure you're doing that regardless of what uh, OTDR you go with at the end of your, your decision. So final thoughts, um, you know, we've gone about uh, over an hour now. Um, so final thoughts, definitely recommend a LinkView software. Uh, it has its advantages, but definitely make sure that you, uh, you keep the raw trace file around 
uh, as well because it's a great add-on to the raw trace file. But a lot of times to troubleshoot something, uh, you really need to be able to see the trace file. So having access to that is definitely a requirement. Go with the company uh, who can provide a U.S.-based warranty um, as the products overseas. You know, typically, we're getting high failure rates, issues, warranties, things of that nature. Um, all about you know you guys finding the right price point and getting the most competitive price. But definitely would recommend um, you know going with a U.S. Uh, company that can warranty it and uh, provide the service that you need. Always use a launch box or pulse suppressor. Um, so make sure you're getting a quote on those whenever you're getting a quote on your products. Um, uh, and then if you need any uh, assistance with generation of trace reports or things of that nature, um, you know, that's another thing to kind of consider is um, who's going to be doing that trace analysis. Um, it's one of the things that we, you know, we offer as a company while well, people send trace files to us, clean them up and do bi-directional analysis. But if you're going to, you know, request that a, a, a partner do that type of service for you, make sure that you're, you're um, you know, picking a platform that has a, you know, SOR uh, type of file format um, that can be exported to because that's kind of the universal standard out there. Otherwise, you might have some sort of compatibility issues that may arise. So um, those are the final thoughts I had for you. I uh, really appreciate your time today. It's been a pleasure to, uh, to go through some of this with you. Hopefully, uh, I was clear on most of my points. And if you have any other questions, feel free to email us at sales at fiberoptic.com. More than happy to take any questions that you may have directly, and uh, I would love to be able to point you in the right direction and make sure you're comfortable with your, your end purchase. Thanks so much. Have a great day. Looking for any questions, so we'll open it up and uh, see what we have here. Don't see any questions. Coming in. I'll wait just a few minutes if there is. Otherwise, we'll wrap it up. Okay. Well, it looks like I was 